Hey you! Yeah you! Do you like overwhelmingly hard games? Games that make you struggle? Games that make you want to contact a therapist? Well boy do I have a game for you, and it's called Fear and Hunger. Quick disclaimer, the game contains a lot of violence, and depictions of wieners. You have been warned. The layout of this video will be the first half being reviewish with light spoilers and the second half containing more spoilers with the commentary of one of my runs. And onto the video. What is Fear and Hunger? Well, it's a survival horror dungeon crawler where you pick one of four characters and you delve into an average Ohio neighborhood. I, I, I mean dungeon. The story and atmosphere definitely pay homage to Berserk and if you're familiar with the manga, you'll be doing a lot of these. The dungeon is built on top of ruins of an ancient civilization slash primordial evil and its MVP prisoner is a captain of a mercenary group named Lagarde. That's the basic gist of the story for now and it branches off depending which playable character you pick and access to 9 unique endings. Well first you pick your difficulty of choice, more on this one later. As for the characters, you have Kahara the hunky merc who was hired to retrieve Lagarde from the dungeon. You have Kirkland Koska, who is here to rescue her love Lagarde. You have Enki, the emo intellectual, who is at the dungeon for knowledge. And last you have Rag, Ragnavaldir, who is here to rip and tear through the dungeon to erase all evil and get his revenge on Lagarde. And the cool part is when you pick one character, the other characters end up being NPCs in the game you can interact with. You pick your character of choice and you start the game. You spawn directly at the front gates of the dungeon, however if you take your sweet time dilly-dallying and looting the boxes outside, the game sends you an appetizer of what you'll be dealing with. Release the hounds. Immediately die, start it up again, and with your newfound fear, run into the safety of the dungeon. While we're here, let me tell you a bit about the twisted mind of the creator. Impressively, the team consists of one man. Miro, aka Orange, hailing from Finland. Man, those 19 hour long Finnish nights really do get to a guy. According to an interview, which I linked the full one in the description below, here he says that the original idea for the game started by asking one of his classmates what he would do in these different, morally awkward scenarios that would take place in a dungeon. Fast forwarding a bit, Orange needed some academic credits, so naturally he decided to turn that concept into a game for his school project. My man even wrote his thesis about the game. That's pretty rad. Okay, back to the dungeon, and let's talk combat. Ah, uh, here's our first enemy now. Oh my god, what is that? Orange, I need a therapist, not the right. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Okay, so combat. It's a turn-based system with a nifty mechanic. A la Dead Space, you fight the enemies via strategic dismemberment. Enemy has a giant sword? Just lop that arm off. Enemy has a huge long? Give him a circumcision that you'll never forget. And every enemy is a threat and has a unique way of ending your run prematurely. So you have to observe the enemy carefully and dismember accordingly, making it a sort of twisted, gory puzzle. However, on the flip side, the enemies in the environment can also dismember you, so if you aren't careful, you end up like that guy from uh, Forrest Gump, just limbless and depressed. And if you think fighting enemies is all you have to worry about, oh man, do I have some news for you. The game is called Fear and Hunger for a reason. Along with your health bar, you also have to monitor your hunger levels and your sanity. Feeling a little peckish? Have some moldy bread, just like how Ma used to make it. The little one in your party freaking out? Give him some of Grandpappy's medicine. Opium and booze. Yeah, let's get lit down in the dungeon, boys! And this being the 1500s and all, we don't have access to the wonders of modern medicine. So we're going Oregon Trail up in here, guys. We get dysentery and tetanus. Step on a rusty nail? Sorry, dude. You gotta reenact that scene from Saw. And there are many more debuffs for you to discover in the magical land of the dungeon. I mean, have you ever seen a debuff like this before? My god! And the next mechanic that's used in combat and the overworld, Mother Lovin' Coin Flips. There's something about this mechanic that scratches at the generic gambler itch in my brain. I mean, just look at my Robin Hood account after I discovered options. Damn, I should really do something about that. The mechanic is simple enough. You call heads or tails, the coin flips, depending on the situation you either die, 
that chest you looted holds nothing, or you can fall through the floor and injure yourself. Intrinsically, a coin flip always has 50-50 odds. So the game doesn't even have to ask you if you want to do heads or tails, because it'll always be 50-50. But the fact that the game does ask you, and you have to choose... Because I don't know what's going to happen to you either. ...as insult to injury when you pick wrong. Man, is it a devious mechanic. You do have access to a rare item, the lucky coin that increases your odds. But again, they are rare, which adds pressure on when to use them. And it'll always be bothering you on whether to use it now or save it for later. And the item is not foolproof, you can still get shafted by the RNG and wasting it. And I do see some complaints about this mechanic introducing randomness and inflating difficulty. And I totally agree with that sentiment, I see where you guys are coming from. But from a design point of view, I think it really works selling the cruel despair of the world that Orange wanted to depict. And if you need to take a break and save the game, one way is to rest in a bed. Beds are numerous in the dungeon, but this game won't give it to you that easy. If you want to save, the coin flip makes an appearance, and if you fail... I'm a bird! Next up we have the art design. Orange is heavily influenced by Ayami Kojima, and it definitely shows with the character designs for the game. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison, you can really see it in the eyes. As for the enemies, they're all unique and elicit a deep primal fear and uncanny valley vibe that's hard to beat and will make Kentaro Miura or Junji Ito proud. You have man with pig penis. Penis Yetus. Look how messed up this one is. And Uncle Touchy. Come here. And many, many more unholy abominations. The set pieces are great themselves. The dungeon and other close-off spaces are claustrophobia inducing. And to flip that, you have a couple of open areas, such as the meadow and the ancient city locations. And reminds me of those uneasy feelings you get when watching abandoned mall videos or abandoned town videos. Yeah, I know it's a weird example to make, but go check out the video and you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm also including the music and sound effects as part of the art design, because music is like art, man. The sound effects do a great job of getting the hair on the back of your neck to stand up. Squishy sounds, walking on masses of flesh. Attacking an enemy gives you a visceral reaction when you slash into their bodies. And the moans of the poor souls in the dungeon, adding to the atmosphere. And the music. First the intro, and it's awesome. While the title slowly creeps at you, the music gives you a sense of dread and reminds me of an old school art house horror movie title sequence. Man, what a mouthful. And the soundtrack in other places just adds depth. While walking the halls of an empty city, the music is slightly off key and whispers are added into the mix, selling the illusion that you aren't alone. Honestly, the soundtrack as a whole could work as an ASMR video giving you the wrong type of tingles. Well, that's pretty much it. Nothing else to really talk about. Oh wait, this mode. Time for the hardest mode the game has to offer, Dungeon Nights. Now you have to monitor your health, hunger, fear, and a gamer's true challenge? Social, Social interactions. interactions! Forget those unforgiving enemies and forget that brutal dungeon. Now we need a date for the prom. It's like a 90s sitcom up in here. This lighthearted mode you get for beating the game is truly the cherry on top for a one-of-a-kind experience. Well, that's fear and hunger. In summary, a refreshingly brutal game and honestly one of the more unique experiences I've had in gaming. The lore is so incredibly enthralling, and the combat was both fear and anxiety inducing. And it still amazes me that one guy is behind all of this. And if you do want to play the game, head on over to Steam and pick up a copy. It's already cheap, and I've seen it on sale quite often, so just wishlist it for later. Ah, <sighs> finally done with the game. The nightmare can now end. Hey, what's this? <gasps> No! Alright, if you made it this far into the video, thank you. And if you enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate a sub and a like. I'm trying to reach 1,000 subs. And if you didn't like the video, just tell me in the comments that my video sucked and I'll give you a like. Alright, now for the second half of the video, I'm going to do a commentary run of one ending for the game for your enjoyment of my misery or as a sort of guide for those that might need help if they decide to pick up the game. And I don't know if I need to say this, but spoilers obviously, but still scratching the surface of what the game has to offer. And
and let's go. So for the run, I pick Ahara, mainly because of lock picking, escape plan, and dash. The reasoning why is, I have to get down to the 7th level of the dungeon as fast as possible because I want to put Lagarde onto my squad. And the only way to do that is to get to him in under 30 real-time minutes. And these skills are going to help out big time. I get lucky with a couple of coin tosses. I come to the girl locked in the cage. I use lock picking. don't even have to find any keys. I find Enki, chit chat with him for a bit. I use the mock-up book to open up the shelf. I go and chit chat with Outlander for a bit. I pray to Ulmer. That'll come in handy for later. I ambush the torturer whose name is creatively Torturer. Kill him pretty easily. I get his key. Now we're at the level 3 prison. We're making pretty good time. I unlock this lever here so I can go down this elevator. Now we're at level 4. Just three more levels away to get to Lagarde. We chit chat with some guy here in the cavern. His name is Nostromus. He leaves. We need to talk with this guy for a bit. So in order to do that, I amputate all of his arms. Once that's out of the way, now we can chit chat. Now I can get the Eclipse Talisman, which I need in order to get Enki onto the squad. I wasn't paying attention and I ended up losing my arm pretty early into the run. Not the best, but I can manage with that. We walk by these creepy cannibal guys and we finally make it to the level 7 catacombs. Walk in, lock picking yet again, comes coming in handy. Enki, I give him the Eclipse Talisman and we have him on the team. I find a saving book, go in here. Hey look, it's Lagarde, he's alive. Causes a little cutscene where the girl examines him. Looks like she recognizes him somehow, might come into play later. We chit chat for a bit with Lagarde and he joins her party. Now with that out of the way, we can actually get to the meat and potatoes of fear and hunger. Bump into Chromaller, but because we have the escape plan skill, we can just run away no problem. Take these staircases back up. We find a chair, and in this chair, we take a moment to realize how badly we messed up coming into these dungeons. And then, once we're done with that, back on our merry way, we come back up to the prison, I step on a rusty nail, that kind of sucks. Find a door that I can't use lockpicking on, so I decide to open it with sheer force. And I find Miasma, an awesome weapon to get early on. Look at that, it basically doubles her damage straight off the bat. Come in, mess around with these Dark Priests for a bit. Easy fight. Then we pray to Ulmer again by sacrificing a person. We go to the Hexen table and we unlock Blood Portal. All that praying to Ulmer was for that. Now we can create a Blood Portal which is basically our fast travel. We chit chat with some mole people and this scene gets me every time. Boom, just like that, random act of violence. And the guy just walks away like nothing happened. After some more exploring, we find the cube of depths, which we need for later. Now with the cube, we're able to open up that door. We head in. And now we're in the ancient city part of the game. Ancient city Maharabe. Maharabe. We bump into the nameless figurine, and he gives us a quest to go get three souls and to bring it back to him so we can open up the passageway that he's blocking. I create a blood portal here. Now we have easy access from the bottom to the top of the map, if so be it, and a safe place to rest. I use a cube in order to initiate time travel. And now we're in the Maharabe in the past. Find a ancient library, meet some crazy looking bebes, and Enki decides to sit back for a bit so he can check out some of these books. I explore more of the library, and I find a puzzle with some mannequins. Uh, the solution's around the map, you can go find it out for yourself. I solve it, and Enki decides to rejoin the party, head deeper into the library, and we see some guy right there. And he just yeets himself off the bookshelf. Ooh, okay. We decide to follow him down, and it's a big brain boy, the Enlightened One, which is the god of knowledge, pretty much. We hit his brain for a bit, dumb him down, then he opens up his third eye. And for the rest of the fight, in order to deal damage, we just have to answer trivia questions. Which is pretty weird, but cool. We managed to beat him down with our knowledge, and that's the enlightened soul out of the way. 
that I decided to sleep in that bed, but this time in the past. Which brings us to the present day somehow in the Kingdom of Rondon. And in this section, we kind of go through everyone's origin story before heading into the dungeon. Here we see Kohara's origin story, and the reason why he took the job to go to the dungeon was so he can buy a better life for him and his lady friend, who happens to be pregnant and still in business. And then over here we see Enki was about to Jesus Christ himself until he gets an epiphany about going into the dungeon. And just added it here, we see some kid get pulled into the shadows by some ominous figure. Not related to us, but a cool little detail. Then we get transported to Ragnaldir's origin story. And here we see that his village got pillaged by Lagarde's mercenary group so they can get the Cube of Depths, which we're using right now to time travel. We get chased around by some dogs until we find a hut and it activates a little cutscene with Ragnvaldir saying that the cube is gone. We head into the little hut house and we see a granny over there in the shadows, spinning some yarn. Hi, granny. Need some help? Well, never mind. Looks like she's a boss. We wail on the old lady for a bit. Not that big of a problem. Holy shit! Granny became nightmare fuel. Nightmare granny does seem kind of intimidating, but once you wail on her for a bit, get rid of her three arms, it's actually kind of an easy fight. And with Nightmare Granny out of the way, we get to see Lagarde's and Darcy's origin story. And here they talk about Lagarde fulfilling some prophecy. Lagarde kind of shoots down that prophecy to Darcy, but then we cut to Lagarde by himself, and there he thinks that he could achieve some type of godhood. Then we cut back to us, the player, and we see a god flying in front of us, Nilvin. And luckily for this one, we don't have to fight her, and she just gives us the endless soul. So now we have two out of the three souls we need. Unfortunately, in the last fight, the girl got her arm infected, and I'm all out of medicine. So the only solution now is... Yeah... Alright, in this next section, to get the third soul, I got pretty lost, just running around the city in circles. So I decided to check back in the past. Present. Ah, oh, man, it's so confusing. I go back to the present. I walk around for a bit, then I find this little cliff. I toss a rock to see if it lands on anything. Ah, fairly close by. So I decide to jump down myself. And look at that, a secret entrance. And then it leads me into a lab full of mannequins. I investigate the lab. Don't really see anything of note until I bump into this machine. I put in my blood. It mixes around with some other chemicals. And then lo and behold, I made a clone of myself. So it turns out that the clone is following me around, so I figured that I have to lead it somewhere. In the present, I find this temple with some type of contraption. I play around with it, don't really get anywhere with it, so I decide to check it out in the past. I go back to the temple in the past, I see some poor guy chained up. So now the contraption works in the past, and it gives me the option of sacrificing the husk. So the poor husk gets put up on these chains, and then I have to spin the wheels around, in order to liberate the husk from his skin. This guy wants to pick a fight with us. I decide the better idea is to just run away from him. So as I'm running away, there's a pool of blood now. I investigate around the pool, don't find anything, so I decide to go for the exit, but then something stops us. And out from the pool comes a third god, the one we've been taking forever to find, the Tormented One. Finding the Tormented One was pretty easy, just knock off his arms, and you go for some big damage on him. And then lo and behold, phase two. Phase two took me ages to figure out until I realized that you can hit the little outer perimeter rings and it will stop him from attacking. Once I figured that out, easy peasy, hit the rings, wail on his body, and you're good to go. Now with the tormented one out of the way, we get the third soul that we've been looking for, the tormented soul. Now with the three souls, we can go back to the present and show them to the nameless figurine. And then he'll give us our last trial. A battle with him. Pretty easy compared to what we've been dealing with. Knock out his arms, attack the head, and we're pretty much done. Now with him out of the way, we can finally get through that doorway to the Golden Temple. Go inside the temple, we hear some barking, so we decide to go near the source of the sound. And we find Francois. Francois is the fourth god from the trio that we've killed so far, and he gives us a little hint about taking care of Francois in the past. He gives us the King's Passage key, 
and we're on our way. As we walk away, he decides to unleash the hounds on us. A dick move, by the way. We get to the inner temple. Nothing really to do here, so I decide to light up the beacons and go back outside to the time machine. Take the time machine, and now I can use the king's passage key to open up the door to the golden temple in the past. Go into the inner temple, and there we see Francois, the dominating one, in all his glory, waiting for us. We initiate a fight with Francois. As a humanoid character, we just do what we normally do and lop off the arms until he can't hit us anymore. Hit him a couple more times, and then we start phase two, where he smelts himself with gold. There are two tricks for the Francois fight. The first one is to use the talk option, and you can confuse him with your words, which causes him not to attack for a couple of turns. And the second trick is to attack the torso instead of the head. And once you figure that out, the fight becomes trivial. Now with Francois defeated, Lagarde uses the opportunity to take the throne for himself. Lagarde claims the throne, and he just disappears. Now my party only consists of three people, so I decide to go get one more member, just to fill it up, just in case if I run into any more battles. So I go to the meadow, into the tree, to get Ragnvaldir. Once Ragnvaldir is in my party, I go back to the Golden Temple, take a seat on the throne, and I get teleported to a different realm. After I teleport, I get split up from my party, and now I have to go and track everyone down. I find Ragnvaldir setting up camp, I find Enki hiding in a hole, and I found the girl hanging out with some demented dinosaur baby. And now the gang is back together. And as we're exploring, we're being chased down by some terrifying presence. And once he finds you, it's a freaking T-Rex, dude! What the hell? It's pretty much an insta-death. Okay, and back to the adventure. After walking around in circles, I finally find a wooden trail. I follow it up, and look who it is! It's Lagarde! Turns out Lagarde has been stuck here for a hundred years, and he's finally achieved godhood. And Lagarde gives us two options here. Kneel to him and accept him as our god, or refuse and initiate a boss fight. And for the sake of the commentary run and time, I decided to kneel to him, which gives us one ending to the game and gives us an epilogue about the great god Lagarde. Roll credits, and that's Fear and Hunger. Thank you, subscribe, and peace out.